The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello and welcome to Health for a Lifetime. I'm your host, Don McIntosh. We're glad you're with us. Also today we have Dr. Hans Deal with us. Welcome, Dr. Deal. Good to be here, Don. Uh, many times when I've spoken with you or we've talked over the years, we've talked about the CHIP program, the Coronary Health Improvement Program. And just recently you've finished a new series of videos updating that with the latest scientific information, all those different things. It's a delight to watch. We've used it in our community. I understand that these uh, videos are also available for other communities or other groups that want to get the message of health out and have a team to support them. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, today we, we have a very interesting subject though, uh, the brain undernourished or overfed uh, to that effect and, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that. What, what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, usually when we talk about being overfed and undernourished we think more about the body usually. You know, mm -hmm. Too much food, the wrong foods, not the proper nutrient values. But could it be that we have a similar situation with the brain where some portions of the brain such as the frontal lobe are actually underfed in contrast to the other portions of the brain which are overfed. I mean just think about the informational age. We're barraged with reports on stocks and bonds and greed and scandals and everything else and could it be that some portions of the brain that take in that information, namely the back portion of the brain, are actually overfed mm -hmm. at the expense of the frontal lobe where we store ethical values, uh, spiritual values, uh, family values. That's the question. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like from that question that you have an answer. <laughs> well, uh, you see, uh, when, when you look at the brain, you look at the ultimate computer. Uh, you have three pounds of uh, gray mass, uh, you have some 50 to 100 billion cells, and they all work together. It's sort of the ultimate computer network. I mean, and in this computer network, everything is stored. Uh, our experiences early in life, uh, we can have recalls within split seconds. This is the ultimate design of electrochemical stimuli. Uh, that are uh, representing many, many, many computers that are all hooked together. It's nothing like it ever designed. So what you're suggesting is that to, even though it's a great design, we could uh, somehow maybe make it be out of balance or undernourish a part or whatnot. You know, it's very interesting when you think about the brain. Uh, brain anatomists began to map out uh, the, the, the brain area and as they probed with um, uh, el uh, special electrodes uh, while people were sort of under anesthesia they began to realize that when you simulated the back area of the brain that you see right now then all of a sudden they talked about figures and facts and uh, these kind of things. But when they began to stimulate the frontal lobe, all of a sudden it was different. There you, all of a sudden they talked about, I hear music of Beethoven, they talked about ethical things, they talked about family values. And you see, it's interesting, isn't it, that when you have, for instance, uh, a rainbow that you see, you see that the back of your of your brain. Mm -hmm. When you have a kiss, just like you see on the video right now there, when you have a kiss, that kiss is not being perceived <laughs> sort of uh, on, on the lips. lips. No, it's back there on the sensory strip right there. And that's why somebody said, well, it's probably all in the brain anyway, and it is. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, uh, it's in your head. It's all in your head. Yeah, and you have a very carefully structured sensory strip. Uh, this sensory strip is sort of in the middle of the brain, the outer cortex here, and it picks up the different sensory information in different areas. For instance, you can pick up uh, materials pertaining to the knees at the very top of the strip, 
or uh, when you uh, perhaps uh, begin to move your trunk, you pick up uh, sensor information right on the trunk or the hands, and so on. It goes down the line, face and neck, or for instance, the lips and the tongue. And please note, look how large the area for the lips and the tongue is. Mm. This is because the brain assigns um, groups of cells according to the precision that is needed. For instance, language and language, uh, the formation of our lips, mm -hmm. um, all of that takes a lot more um, uh, uh, groups of brain cells. Mm -hmm. So you have much more territory assigned on the sensory strip. Hmm. So I, I've heard this that an elephant they have such a large brain because it has they have to operate the trunk. Yes. And all of that goes right to, yes. to, the, to the nose. Well, for instance, if you happen to have a stroke, mm -hmm. you can see it right there. You see those three little areas there? Yes. This is now affecting the mouth area and perhaps the tongue area. And that person will not receive sensor information after a stroke pertaining to the mouth and the tongue. And therefore, they might have speech impediments after a stroke. Problems talking, all that. Yes. Okay. But aside from that sensory strip, you have another strip right next to it, and that's called the motor strip. And here now, you have information that is coming into the sensory strip, mm -hmm. and within milliseconds, that information is translated and being pushed towards the motor strip, and it now activates things on the motor strip. Mm. For instance, if uh, you uh, hurt your knee, this is the information that comes to your brain, it goes to the sensory strip where the knee is located, right? Mm -hmm. And then it immediately is being transferred to the motor strip so that you begin to jerk your knee. Okay. And all of this happens in split seconds. It's all integrated very, very carefully and processed. Mm. It's amazing. amazing. It really is. Mm -hmm. So here again now, when you look at the motor strip, you again see the lips are unusually large in the space that uh, these uh, brain cells occupy. Again, mm -hmm. just think about um, how we form our lips, how we form mm -hmm. words, and how all these muscles have to work together to produce language. And that's why somehow we have a larger area right there. So the sensory strip and the motor strip, they're closely aligned. Mm. So uh, the when we are involved in a bad habit, say smoking, it has the lips and these different things involved in it, would that be the reason it's so hard to change that habit because there's such a pattern right there? Yeah, it could very well be. You have to develop sort of a brain rut type of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And every time you do something, it gets into that same pattern again. Mm. Okay. So we want to break up the pattern somehow. Hopefully. Yeah, we want to break up that pattern. Feed the right place and not the... Yeah, okay. but then the question is, how do we really do this? So we have to be concerned about the sensory strip Mm -hmm. And we have to be concerned about the motor strip because that's where things are happening. Well, what about the frontal lobe then? Uh, what, what role does it play? That looks like midbrain, what we've been talking about. What does the frontal lobe yeah. do? Well, maybe I can tell you a story. <laughs> you know, I love it, stories. It happened at, at Harvard University. Uh, a young man by the name of Phineas Gage was tamping uh, dynamite and somehow... Uh, as he was working there, uh, the dynamo exploded and sent uh, one of these uh, rods, iron rods, from his lower eye right through the frontal lobe, coming out again. And everybody was concerned about Phineas Gage. What did, would happen to him? Did he die? That's the amazing thing. He did not die, but this wound actually healed. Hmm. But something happened. Phineas Gage, after this, uh, this accident, was no longer the same Phineas Gage. Mm. You see, before this accident, he was very responsible. He was devoted to one woman. He was a family man. He was reliable. He was just high character kind of a person. Mm -hmm. Ethical, moral, all those different things. Yeah. Uh, and then something happened. This accident took place. And all of a sudden, Phineas Phage was no longer Phineas Phage. He was no longer the dependable person that would come to work on time. He was no longer the devoted husband. He would now follow more the wine, women, and song kind of a motto of life. Mm -hmm. Something had happened. Something had changed the taproot of his personality. It was no longer the same Phineas Gage. And it was later that researchers began to understand that what had, what had actually happened was 
that the frontal lobe had been damaged where you have ethical values, family values, mm. spiritual values located. When you damage that frontal lobe, something then can happen to the person. Mm. So uh, here on the graphic, then, is this the part you're talking about? This was the part that was damaged? Uh, yeah, that's correct. And it just uh, took that out. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and you see, as a result of this, his personality began to change. His temperament began to change. The ethical values were now being changed and modified. His judgment was no longer quite there. And his religious values, all of a sudden, had a different connotation. So then it's the frontal lobe where these values reside. And my question is, could it be that in our society, which emphasizes uh, informational pieces, um, uh, an information data, overload, yeah, mm -hmm. data, statistics, facts and figures, that feeds the back portion of the brain. Could it be that the back portion of our brains is overloaded, overfed, and maybe it's at the expense of a balance where you have then also the feeding of the frontal lobe, mm. responsibility, temperament, and so on. So uh, out of balance, that's an excellent question. Could it be that we're feeding the back portions of the brain while neglecting the first, the front portions, or in other words, having a self-induced <laughs> lobotomy, so yes, to speak, yes, where yes. we're doing a Phineas Gage on ourselves? Excellent question. We've been talking with Dr. Hans Deal. We're talking about the brain. Are we feeding the right parts, the right things in the right way? When we come back, we're going to answer that question, and we hope you'll join us. Have you found yourself wishing that you could shed a few pounds? Have you been on a diet for most of your life, but not found anything that will really keep the weight off? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, then we have a solution for you that works. Dr. Hans Deal and Dr. Eileen Lettington have written a marvelous booklet called Reversing Obesity Naturally, and we'd like to send it to you free of charge. Here's a medically sound approach successfully used by thousands who are able to eat more and lose weight permanently without feeling guilty or hungry through lifestyle medicine. Dr. Deal and Dr. Ludington have been featured on 3ABM, and in this booklet, they present a sensible approach to eating, nutrition, and lifestyle changes that can help you prevent heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer. Call or write today for your free copy of Reversing Obesity Naturally, and you could be on your way to a healthier, happier you. It's absolutely free of charge. So call or write today. Welcome back. We've been talking with Dr. Hans Deal, and we've been talking about the brain, and more specifically, the frontal lobe. Dr. Deal, I have a question about this story about Phineas Gage. He, he was the one that had that uh, self-induced uh, frontal lobotomy with that rod going through his brain. Uh, did it just affect his character and personality? Was anything else damaged in his brain? Did it affect his memory? Yeah, it's very interesting. It did not affect his brain in terms of memory, function, or intelligence, but it affected his willpower and his moral uh, values. So he was coordinated, able to walk to work, or do all these everything. different things. He could remember who he was and everything. He just was... Well, it seems that the taproot of his personality had been changed. That was the big thing. The taproot of his personality was cut. Mm -hmm. The frontal lobe had become affected. Mm -hmm. So he was just operating on the other portions of his brain rather than yeah. funneling through that part. Well, there's a, there's a famous uh, Russian scientist, uh, Dr. Luria, and he recently said, he said, the frontal lobe is the superstructure above all parts of the brain performing a universal function of general regulation of behavior and self-control. This is a Russian scientist, Dr. Bernal Baldwin, recently said, um, as a brain physiologist, he said, when you look at the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe is the front seat driver of the brain. Hmm. Now, it's almost like a symphony conductor. He says the frontal lobe integrates, synthesizes, brings together, creates balance, um, spiritual values, uh, service orientation, these kind of things are seated in that frontal lobe. And that's the symphonic conductor. If that's indeed the symphonic conductor, you will hear music hmm. instead of noise. 
So aside from having a terrible injury like Phineas Gage, uh, could we be inducing uh, frontal lobe damage by things we do as Americans or as uh, individuals, maybe not just in America but wherever, uh, uh, in our own lifestyle? There are probably various ways of how you can damage the frontal lobe and how you can build it. Mm -hmm. You can damage it by perhaps uh, playing down the sense of responsibility, making ethical judgments, and basically um, perhaps focusing on facts and data and so on. You can also harm this by alcohol, by um, habit patterns that are now emerging as being perhaps not in the best interest of health, they now appear to be irresponsible choices. Mm -hmm. So you can damage the frontal lobe by our behaviors, but we can also build it up. Mm -hmm. uh, let's come to that building up in just a minute, but uh, one of the things that damages it is alcohol. What, are, what would be some other foods or different things that would damage it? Well, I don't know if there are specific foods, but I would think that, for instance, when you have um, an, a pension for violent uh, exposures uh, uh, via movies or becoming involved in violent behaviors. These are then things that perhaps damage the frontal lobe. It's not just the physical damage that I talked about in mm -hmm. Phineas Gage's situation, but it could also be these kind of things that we embrace, visual things that come into our uh, frontal lobe. So we need to be careful about what we eat, what we drink, what we see, what we hear, all those different things. Well, you know, I kind of wonder what the effect of soap operas might be on the frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. You know, allurements. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are all things that perhaps don't build that sense of having a balanced lifestyle to shape the ethical values that we were called to have. So by beholding, we're changed. Yeah, yeah. You can behold different things. You can behold violence or you can behold, shall we say, family values. Mm -hmm. uh, you can perhaps become concerned about how do I take care of my kids? Mm -hmm. How can I make time for my children so I am a father that is involved in shaping the destiny of my kids? I mean, these are all values that relate to giving of yourself, mm -hmm. serving others, nobility of purpose, love. These are all values that apparently influence the frontal lobe. Let's say someone's watching today and they accidentally turn to 3ABN instead of their soap opera. <laughs> and they realize that, hey, they, have, they are just hooked on this, this particular soap opera and they just watch it again and again. And maybe they want to change it. Uh, what, what are some of the good things they can do uh, to replace that? Yeah, what are we going to do? Well, first of all, if I think you want to perhaps expose yourself to some other things. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you want to read a biography or uh, perhaps pick up a video that talks about, shall we just say, the life of Albert Schweitzer, mm -hmm. a man who uh, was a great organist, well-known, famous, and yet he was drawn by the needs in Africa and then turned his life around and now became involved in serving others. Maybe that would be one step. Mm -hmm. So read biographies, read uh, meaningful history, read these types of things that there are noble characters that we're, we're focusing on. Yeah, but I think it has to go beyond that. I think once we become more aware that our greatest joy in life really comes by being of service to others mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a proper way, uh, once we realize that there's a nobility in becoming involved in the betterment of our society, mm -hmm. um, then we have to just go beyond that recognition and do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. means, what can we do? So we can then focus on these noble characters, we can maybe read the Bible, look at the life of Christ, all these different things, and uh, this is going to help us in our actions and different things as well. Anything else? Yeah, it will balance our personality. It will drive the personality in a more balanced fashion. You know, when I was doing the CHIP program in India, mm -hmm. I ran across a story of one of the Indian philosophers. And the story is told of um, an affluent man, a Brahmin in the Himalayas. It was wintertime, it was cold, and uh, as he was uh, 
on his way home, he saw some human wreckage mm -hmm. on the side of the uh, walk, a drunken body. And he first tried to make his way home and ignore what he saw. And then he thought about that. He went back and he picked up this bundle of humanity, put it on his back. It was cold. And he dragged this man home and took care of him. Hmm. The next morning, the light came on in his mind. Mm -hmm. And he realized that this man, this human wreckage, had actually given him the human warmth that he needed to make it home without freezing to death. Hmm. And so here it is, as you serve others, you also, I guess, find true happiness yourself. And that's what you've found in, the, in the, uh, serving others in the CHIP program around the world, too. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, but it really all comes down in the end, I think, at least for me, mm -hmm. to one basic question, uh, you know, what is really the purpose of our life? And, you know, I'm reminded of this light bulb here. You know, uh, this has something to do with uh, our purpose of life. Uh, you know, this light bulb can look pretty good. Uh, we can look pretty good on the outside. We can smell good. We get all powdered up to coming on the set here. You know, the wrinkles are all taken care of. Well, almost all. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, everything looks good. But, you know, the purpose of life, really, mm -hmm. to me at least, is to better the life of someone else, mm -hmm. to illumine the pathway of someone else. You see, uh, life can look pretty good on the outside. You got your BMW in the garage. Your house is paid for. Everything looks nice on the outside. But if you are not connected on the inside, if there is no central mooring to a source of power, mm -hmm. when there is no, um, you know, the symphony conductor is not there mm -hmm. to make music out of your life, and it's just noise, then we begin to realize that maybe something is missing. Maybe we're not plugged in. Maybe just like this filament inside this light bulb, mm -hmm. if that filament is broken, or if that filament is not connected to the power net, there's nothing going to happen. It just looks good, but it doesn't. Yeah, but if it do is good. connected, look. That's right. You see, and I think yeah. that to me at least has become an illustration of the purpose of life. If my life does not illumine the pathway of someone else, mm -hmm. then it's not really lived in its fullest sense. Mm -hmm. And so I have found in my own life that by being able to respond and to give and to make it part of my, my thinking and feeling of being other person oriented, it, it doesn't quite have that quality that is now so meaningful to me. And that is one of the reasons why the CHIP program, the Coroner Health Improvement Project, has become such a great joy to me because through it, people can learn responsibility. They can learn how to make some simple lifestyle changes and the hypertension disappears, mm -hmm. they lose weight, uh, the cholesterol levels go down, the heart disease diminishes, the diabetes oftentimes is no longer there, mm -hmm. and that gives me a profound joy, and I know that, you see, then my life, hopefully, will illumine the pathway of someone else, and maybe of whole towns or cities. Mm -hmm. Now, I notice here, uh, you know, in your video series, and of course I've used it in, in the community that I'm from, and we've had about 700 people go through the program where we are. Currently, uh, now they're running a program, and they run them several times a year, and there are different people from all walks of life there. But what I notice in that program, you talk about the light going on, and I want to see whether or not you agree with me on this. You present, I mean, I, I have people that come, you know, <laughs> to the program, and they're, they, they've been somehow drugged there by circumstances you know <laughs> their maybe, wives. maybe their wife is you know mrs <laughs> circumstance i don't know or whatever and they're there and they are not really happy to be there but then the information starts to come to them and i don't know maybe that's midbrain information because there's a lot of facts and different things and it kind of moves maybe from the back you get them up there walking around or the program does in our particular thing we have a map where they're walking along and uh, you know they're starting to drink water which they never drank water before all those different things and then pretty soon about I think it's about week two and you correct me if I'm wrong it seems as though then up here they start saying wait a minute 
they, they make a decision that this is good rather than being, uh, what would you say, tolerated. Is that, is that what you see? Yeah, I think after about two weeks in the CHIP program, the benefits are not coming to these people. You know, there are sometimes very mundane things like, you know, uh, the constipation problem becomes alleviated. And I mean, the light comes on. Well, <laughs> this is very important, yes. Or the blood pressure goes down, and they have now hope again in life. And as we begin to move into the third and fourth week and we begin to talk about, we actually talk about the purpose of life. Mm -hmm. Because health is not just eating right and exercising, but it's also how do you treat yourself and how do you treat your fellow human being. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can eat all the alfalfa sprouts, and if you uh, uh, abuse your wife verbally or uh, you are lying uh, to cover yourself uh, in an employment situation, you're not really healthy. Healthy then has to do with being balanced. Healthy has to do with emotional health, physical health, uh, social health, and spiritual health. And I think that's ultimately where a lot of meaning can come to people as they begin to identify with the finest role model available. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, probably Christ. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah, and I think the Bible puts it that, uh, this way. It says, the light that lighteth every man mm -hmm. is coming into the world. This is the, the whole idea. Um, you know, in, in our our personal experience then with the CHIP program and then with all of these, uh, uh, you know, the interaction we have with these different people, we see them then trying, well, what, what I find, and again, correct me if I'm wrong with your experience, but what I find is that the people that are long-term successful are the ones that move to that frontal lobe uh, consideration, spiritual consideration. Is that right? And that's why we cannot leave it out. It is one of the basic ingredients of good health, how to feed the frontal lobe and strengthen it so that we are not overfed in the wrong area and undernourished in the frontal lobe. A couple weeks ago uh, in our CHIP program we had the privilege of having a friend of yours, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, with us. And you know, as I talk with uh, this wonderful gentleman, um, I saw that in his way of dealing with patients as well, really when it came down to it, the personal interaction that he was having with people was helping them learn how to feed that frontal lobe. And uh, he was, uh, what would you say, spending personal time with these individuals, opening his home, his heart, had a monthly phone call with them. And his study, you know, as you've referenced in your CHIP program many times, uh, is one of the longest running studies that shows long-term success. Yeah. You see, he was not just doing it as a professional person for service, but he was genuinely caring for his patients. He invested himself in their lives, and that's what made all the difference, I think. We've been talking with Dr. Hans Deal. He has given us facts that can feed not only the back of our brain and the middle of our brain, but can help us nourish that frontal lobe and thereby serve others, serve the Lord, and have health that lasts for a lifetime. Yeah.